do appreciate the invitation, the opportunity to come and speak to you this evening. Uh, I don't hardly remember a time in my life when Brother Jeff wasn't in it. Was, we met him down in Louisiana way back in the 80s when I was very small. But uh, I think probably the thing I appreciate, appreciate about him the most is that the Lord used some of his preaching in my own conversion and Amen. has been using him in my sanctification ever since and continues to do so. So it's a great pleasure to be here and I appreciate the opportunity to preach. <clears throat> so if you would turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 10. Jeremiah chapter 10. I'm going to read verses 1 through 16, and after that we'll have a word of prayer. <clears throat> Jeremiah chapter 10, reading from verse 1. Hear ye the word which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven. For the heathen are dismayed at them, for the customs of the people are vain. For one cutteth a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. They deck it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers that it move not. They are upright as the palm tree, but speak not. They must needs be born, because they cannot go. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, neither also is it in them to do good. For as much as there is none like unto thee, O Lord, thou art great, and thy name is great in might. Who would not fear thee, O king of nations? For to thee doth it appertain. For as much as among all the wise men of the nations and in all their kingdoms there is none like unto thee. But they are altogether brutish and foolish. The stock is a doctrine of vanities. Silver spread into plates is brought from Tarshish and gold from Euphaz, the work of the workmen and of the hands of the founder. Blue and purple is their clothing. They are all the work of cunning men. But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and an everlasting king. At his wrath the earth shall tremble, and the nations shall not be able to abide his indignation. Thus shall ye say unto them, The gods that have not made the heavens and the earth, even they shall perish from the earth and from under these heavens. He hath made the earth by his power, he hath established the world by his wisdom, and hath stretched out the heavens by his discretion. When he uttereth his voice, there is a multitude of waters in the heavens, and he causeth the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He maketh lightnings with rain, and bringeth forth the wind out of his treasures. Every man is brutish in his knowledge. Every founder is confounded by the graven image. For his molten image is falsehood, and there is no breath in them. They are vanity and the work of errors. In the time of their visitation they shall perish. The portion of Jacob is not like them. For he is the former, or the maker of all things. And Israel is the rod of his inheritance. The Lord of hosts is his name. Our great and glorious God, we bow before you this evening and we are filled with gratitude towards you because we know that in the many long centuries that have evaporated since these words were first written that you have not changed at all. And that although the world has changed and uh, in many ways things are far different than they were, yet uh, man's nature is still the same, but uh, thankfully, Lord, you have not changed and the gods of the nations are still idols and still unable to help those who are devoted to them, but your people have an everlasting help uh, in the God that made the heavens and the earth. I thank you, Lord, for uh, the opportunity to be here to preach your word and to, uh, to bring this, what I trust will be encouragement to your people, as uh, we are in, a, in many ways much like the people of Judah, the believing remnant of that time, and that we live in a world that is uh, filled with unbelief and much hostility against you and against your word. And so we need encouragement to remain faithful and uh, not to back down in the face of the opposition and, uh, for us at least, the potential of persecution, which is a reality in the lives of many of your people. And so I pray that our hearts and minds might be prepared. Yes. We pray for the help of your Holy Spirit, Lord, for uh, we cannot even speak coherently without your help, but certainly cannot speak in such a way as to uh, do good to the souls of your people or to touch the hearts of the lost, except your Holy Spirit attend and manifest his power uh, in our midst. And so we pray your blessing here and in every place this evening where your word is being proclaimed. Yes. And we ask it all in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> a little over three years ago, I began at our home church a Wednesday evening series of expositions in the book of Jeremiah. We just started chapter 16 last Wednesday. But my reason for uh, preaching through Jeremiah was because it seemed to me then, and uh, the more I uh, worked through it, even more so now, 
But Jeremiah was laboring under spiritual conditions that are in many ways very similar to our own because it was a time of prevalent corruption in all of the areas that you can name, politics, religion, personal and private life. And because of those things, God's judgment was hovering over the land and getting ready to fall. God could have judged and destroyed the kingdom of Judah a long time before he did. He was actually very patient and long-suffering with them and tolerating them as long as he did. <clears throat> One of the things that fascinates me about this book is that, uh, particularly in a part of the country like we live in, and I think it's probably about the same here, judging by the number of churches that we drive by just uh, driving through the city here, it still uh, probably would be referred to as the Bible Belt, so there's still a great deal of religion. And that's the kind of atmosphere that Jeremiah is ministering in. He's not out in the middle of a bunch of heathens. He's right there among the people that are calling themselves the people of God. The people of Judah, to whom Jeremiah was ministering, were still a very religious people. Now, he's not talking to atheists and infidels and people who have no interest in God. He's talking to people who consider themselves to be God's people. They still diligently attended upon the temple with its ceremonies and its sacrifices and they still had their priesthood, and they had a prophetic office, and there were many prophets besides Jeremiah who were preaching in Jeremiah's time. And the tragedy is that among all those prophets, there was, what, maybe one or two besides Jeremiah who were actually telling the truth. These were people who considered themselves to be God's favorites. And they were thoroughly persuaded that none of the types of evil that Jeremiah was talking about could befall them. Just like today, if uh, you're in a church like this and you come and you hear something negative and hear the preacher talk about hell or warn against judgment or go to a church that practices church discipline and you don't like that, well, in Jeremiah's time, if they hear Jeremiah preaching and they didn't like that, they could go right around the corner and find a false prophet who would tell them exactly what they wanted to hear. Back in chapter 7 and verse 4, we find the prophet pleading with the people and saying, "'Trust ye not in lying words.'" That's the words of the false prophet saying, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. Because that's what their confidence was, very much as it was in the time of Christ where they were consistently having to warn the people, don't have confidence in the fact that you're Abraham's seed. Well, Jeremiah's doing the same thing. You've got people who think that they're okay with God because they've got the priesthood, they've got the law, they've got all of these prophets, and they've got the sons of David upon the throne of David. And in spite of the fact that the ten northern tribes, their brethren, had already been carried off into captivity about a hundred years before by the Assyrians, and they were reminded of that back in chapter 3, in spite of even that warning, the people of Judah were confident that because they had the temple, and the Levitical system, and the sons of David ruling in Jerusalem, that the kind of national destruction that Jeremiah was talking about was impossible. God wasn't going to let anything really bad befall them. Well, if they had been walking in faith and obedience to the Lord, such a confidence would have been a worthy thing because God had promised them in the law that if you are an obedient people, that I will protect you. I will uh, vanquish all of your enemies for you. One of you will chase a thousand. But instead, what we find is that their principles and practices had become every bit as bad and in some ways worse than that of their heathen neighbors. In fact, in Ezekiel 16, I preached from that chapter last Sunday at home, he actually tells them that you are worse than Samaria, the northern kingdom, and you're even worse than Sodom, which was about as bad an insult as could possibly be rendered to them. <clears throat> At the same time that they were worshiping Jehovah, they would go right out of the temple and go participate in the debauched heathen rites on the hills and the high places and the fields, and sometimes even going so far as to burn their own children in fire to their heathen idols. Just as today, we find many people who like to call themselves by the name of Christian and oftentimes will speak very loudly about their love for Jesus, and yet they are just as deeply enmeshed in fornication, and filthy entertainment, covetousness, all the works of the flesh. Just as it is now, so it was then that you have this people that belonged to Jehovah, liked to say that they did, but they were ignoring every prohibition of his law and imagining that they were immune from judgment even while they were living in abject rebellion to the Lord. So, much like their descendants to whom Christ our Lord ministered many years later, they imagined that because they were Abraham's children, that repentance was unnecessary for them. Chapter 7 that I've already alluded to, verses 8 through 11, he brings that out very clearly. Behold, ye trust in lying words that cannot profit. 
Will ye steal, murder, and commit adultery, and swear falsely? And you see him just bringing in the Ten Commandments there. Burn incense unto Baal, and walk after other gods whom ye know not. And come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, we are delivered to do all these abominations? Like people who say that we have Christian liberty to walk in the flesh and to walk in uncleanness. Is this, my, is this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, even I have seen it, saith the Lord. And he goes on from there with more warnings. So one of the things that may be learned in Jeremiah is that although a people may call themselves God's people, they may call themselves by the name of the Lord and yet still be entirely pagan in their outlook and their practices. And we live in a nation where, according to the most recent numbers, 65% of the population identifies themselves as Christian. And yet somehow the full spectrum of pagan debauchery has gained acceptance and even celebration in the popular culture, education, entertainment, and for, in many ways even in government. So while we might like to think that we are very different from these Bronze Age Neanderthals, in fact, human nature is exactly the same that it was then, and man just keeps repeating the same errors. It might be a little bit different in the exterior way that things look, but if you dig down beneath the surface, we're really just doing the exact same things that the heathen were doing. We've got rampant immorality, widespread acceptance and practice of fornication and perversion, covered over by religious excuses, gender confusion, and uh, I can't help but uh, digress here for just a moment to point out something to you that was fascinating to me when I learned it in chapter 2 and verse 27. This is something that cannot come across in translation, but uh, if you uh, have a good co uh, commentary, they might perhaps mention this, where, where the people say, saying to a stock, thou art my father, and to a stone, thou hast brought me forth. The fascinating thing is that the word stock that they are calling their father is a feminine word, and the word stone that they are referring to as a mother, thou hast brought me forth, is a masculine word. So paganism producing gender confusion is not something new. That's not something new to our day and time. That's always been one of the results of paganism. We have a 21st century paganism. Again, it looks somewhat different uh, just uh, on the surface, but when you dig down beneath it, it's all rooted in the same principles and produces the same wickedness. So we live in a time and a place where, uh, I suppose with 65% of the people saying that they're Christians, most of the people you're going to run into would say that they belong to the Lord, but in far too many cases, their whole outlook on life and even their practices are as pagan as those of any Gentile nation in the 6th century B.C. Well, so much of what you find in Jeremiah is doom and gloom, so uh, sometimes I get a little concerned as I've worked through these different chapters that people are going to get tired of hearing judgment is coming if you don't repent and this is what the judgment is going to look like because that's what it seems like about 80 to 90 percent of the sermons are but uh, at least it gives me a good opportunity to preach repentance over and over and over which is something that we have to be preaching regularly. Amen. The consistent message of Jeremiah is that judgment is coming this is what the judgment will look like and the only hope is repentance. But although most of it is what we might call negative, there are occasional glimmerings of hope and light. In the third chapter, there are prophecies of hope and blessing for the repentant. He speaks of a time when there will be a change of worship and even says that the Ark of the Covenant, which was so central to the old covenant worship, that that was going to be done away with and that the people would not worship before the Ark of the Covenant as they once had. And a time would come when God would give them pastors according to his own heart. And then this 10th chapter, which has become something of a favorite with me. Uh, this is another beam of light in the dark tunnel of judgment prophecies. These first 16 verses of the chapter are a tremendous declaration of the universal sovereignty of God, the futility and the stupidity of idolatry, much like some of the Psalms. Psalm 115, for instance, is uh, quite similar to what we have here. He expands... Uh, for all of these verses upon the fact that the idols of the nations are really nothing more than dead blocks of wood and stone. They can't help you and they can't hurt you. There's nothing to them except the wood or the stone that they're carved out of. And that being the case, God's believing remnant is not to imitate the heathen and learn their ways, but we are to recognize that our God is the true and the living God and that all others are vanity and the work of error 
and that the time is coming when they will soon perish. Amen. And that brings me to the text that I want to look at tonight, which is verse 11. Thus shall ye say to them, The gods that have not made the heavens and the earth, even they shall perish from the earth and from under these heavens. And so the title for the message is A Message for the Heathen, and we could expand that a little bit and say that it's a message from God to his people for the heathen. I think that uh, after our consideration this evening that you will agree that this is one of the most remarkable, encouraging, and edifying texts in all of the Old Testament. So uh, my message tonight will be very simple. I just want to give an exposition of the text in its context and then make some applications for our present use. <clears throat> so let's take a few moments when, with the exposition of verse 11. Here in chapter 10, we are in the midst of a section of Jeremiah, which really only covers these 16 verses, in which we have the glorious sovereignty of Jehovah, Israel's God, being set in contrast with the idols of the heathen. This was a very necessary lesson for the Hebrew people to learn, because throughout their history, they had often been seduced into idolatry, worshiping the gods of their neighbors, and engaging in the filthy practices that accompanied their heathen services. And now, although the people of Judah were soon to be sent into captivity into Babylon, in fact, it's possible that some of them already had, because Nebuchadnezzar carried away some captives two different times before he finally came in and uh, destroyed the city. The people were going to be sent into captive into a foreign land, just as the law of Moses had warned, but it was not God's intention that they be obliterated as a people from the earth forever. Rather, he would retain a true remnant of worshipers who would be brought to recognize their own sins and the sins of their fathers, to repent, and thus ultimately to be brought back to the land that had been promised to Abraham. God, again, had told them in the law that that's how things would work. You're going to sin, be carried off into captivity, and then when you repent, I will bring you back. And you're going to read Daniel chapter 9, and his great prayer of repentance, and uh, Ezra Chapter 1, you have Zerubbabel bringing uh, the first group of captives back and to trace out the history of all that. <clears throat> but before they were eventually restored, they were going to go through this period where they are captives in a foreign land. And it will be a time of severe temptation because they're going to be separated from the temple, which has been burned down anyway, separated from the land of Canaan that God had promised uh, to the people, and there would be this tremendous temptation to forget their God and basically just to melt into the culture surrounding them. In fact, that is what ordinarily could have been expected to take place with a captive people being separated from their land and customs and institutions. I suspect that's the reason why the Assyrians and then the Babylonians after them uh, dealt with their captives the way that they did. They didn't leave them there in their land and tax them. They would scatter them all over their empire uh, in small groups, and then they would eventually just blend into the culture and their, uh, their ethnic and, uh, and cultural distinctions would eventually just erode away. They would adopt the customs and the culture of the prevalent society and end up intermarrying with them, and eventually they would just disappear as a distinct people. But that was not what God had in mind for Israel. They were to be sustained in the world, and not just as a distinct ethnic group, but as a remnant of true and devout worshipers of Jehovah. And for that to take place, the knowledge of God had to be maintained among them, even in the very heart of Chaldean idolatry. Amen. And the temptation to succumb to the cultural pressures that uh, were around them, those temptations had to be resisted. And again, we find ourselves in a situation very much akin to that which the ancient Jews faced. We're strangers and pilgrims living in the midst of what is essentially a heathen society. The prevailing culture around us certainly is very heathenish, and there's always that temptation just to blend in with the world around us and not be different than the world because we don't want people uh, thinking negative things about us or saying mean things to us. And uh, when things get worse, we can have even greater fears of being persecuted because of our devotion to the Lord. So we face things quite similar to what these uh, the remnant of believing Jews were facing in that time as they were carried off captive into Babylon. So that is the historical background for what is truly one of the most remarkable texts in the Old Testament. And uh, even as I said uh, when I glanced over at chapter 2, verse 27, we have something here that does not come across in the translation. 
and just by the very nature of things, it can't come across. But uh, some of you probably, being good students of the scripture, have uh, looked in a commentary and have seen what I'm going to show to you tonight. Uh, but probably some are here that have not seen this. But this was fascinating to me when I learned it, and I was uh, quite excited when I got up to chapter 10 and was able to preach this back home, and uh, happy to bring it to you this evening as well. The thing that we do not see in our English translation, but uh, if you were reading Jeremiah as it was originally written, you would see, is that verse 11 is the only verse in the whole book of Jeremiah that is not written in Hebrew, but actually is written in Aramaic. Aramaic, which uh, sometimes is called the Syriac language, it was the diplomatic language of the day uh, when Hezekiah's, uh, during Hezekiah's reign when they were under threat from Sennacherib and he had come into the land and captured some of their fortified cities uh, and he sent his ambassadors to Jerusalem to call upon Hezekiah to surrender. You will remember that uh, Hezekiah's officials called down from the wall and said, don't speak to us in Hebrew, speak to us in the Syrian language because that was the diplomatic language of the time. All of the professional diplomats could speak this Syrian or Syriac Aramaic language. And uh, so they were asking them to communicate in the Syriac language. But uh, of course, uh, Sennacherib's officials refused to do that because their intent was to intimidate the people uh, as a whole. But Aramaic was the language spoken by the Chaldeans among whom the captives would be living. And that's why verse 11 is so significant. When he says, thus shall ye speak unto them, what we have to realize is that this is Jeremiah's instructions to a people who are about to find themselves as captives under foreign conquerors in a distant land. They've been dragged out of the land of Canaan, off to a distant place, and deposited there and left there to rebuild their lives as best they can. And very naturally, as they settled in that place and built their homes and began to interact and build relationships with their neighbors and to trade with them, and probably establish uh, friendly relationships with some of the people around whom they were living, they would have the Chaldeans inviting and encouraging them to participate in the worship of their gods. And there would be some pretty persuasive reasons why they might be tempted to do that. After all, their own god, as it appeared, had failed to protect his holy city and his temple. Their god uh, and his temple had been defeated, as it looked, on the surface, they'd been conquered by Nebuchadnezzar and the armies of Babylon, and that's basically how you judge the strength of a god in those days. If my nation attacks your nation and we defeat you, then that proves that my gods are stronger than your gods. So that proved, to the Chaldean mind anyway, that the gods of Babylon are stronger than Jehovah. So you can understand the temptation that these people are facing. And the Chaldeans are saying, come on over to our temple and worship with us and, and participate in our rituals. We have a good time and our worship... And after all, there's no reason to continue worshiping your God. He's obviously not strong enough to resist the gods of Babylon. He hasn't protected you from defeat and uh, your holy city and his temple from destruction. And here you are in a distant country. Just join in with us. Assimilate yourselves to the prevailing culture. Worship the gods who have proven their strength and their power. So it is this them, this remnant of Jews in, uh, in captivity that Jeremiah is telling to... Uh, to communicate this message back to the Chaldeans that they are going to be interacting with. And their message in response to the temptation to join in with the prevailing idolatry was simply this, that appearances can be deceiving, but that the true and loyal followers of Jehovah will not be led astray by the mere appearance of things. Mm -hmm. What an important lesson this is for us to learn, because... Uh, we live in a little bubble of time, and we see the things that are going on around us, and it's very easy not to look at things from uh, even a historical perspective and even less from a biblical perspective, and to keep the eyes of faith wide open when it seems like everything is collapsing all around us. While a cursory glance at present circumstances may suggest that continuing to serve Jehovah was futile, faith would rise above circumstances and realize that even though Jerusalem had been destroyed and the walls pulled down and the temple burned, the truth was that Jehovah had not been defeated. In fact, what had happened was exactly what God told them in the law he was going to do to them. So this wasn't a mark of God being defeated. It was a, a mark of God carrying out the sanctions of his law. Amen. The triumph of the armies of Babylon was not just the victory of Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian gods. It was Jehovah's righteous judgment against 
his covenant people who had been in rebellion to him for many generations now. But it goes even further than that. The very gods in whom the Chaldeans boasted were marked out for destruction. And what a remarkable thing this is that the Jews are called upon to tell their neighbors the gods that have not made the heavens and the earth. And even that phrase in itself is very instructive. This in itself is a polemic against the idols of Babylon, particularly their god Marduk, who was called Lord of heaven and earth. Without saying it in so many words, essentially what they're saying is Marduk is not the Lord of heaven and earth. Our God, whom you are looking upon as a loser God, our God is the true Lord of heaven and earth. The Jews were to boldly face up to their Babylonian interlocutors and tell them that their gods had not made the heaven and the earth. In fact, that they were nothing more than just richly adorned but worthless pieces of wood and stone, even as we read in the first ten verses of the chapter. Not only were the claims of the Babylonian gods to creating power empty, they hadn't created anything. In fact, they themselves had been fashioned out of the hands and perverse imaginations of men. But these gods that the Babylonians were worshiping at so much expense, those gods were destined for destruction. In fact, every god, every pretended deity, anything and everything that men worship except the god who created the heavens and the earth is marked out for destruction. They will all perish. The sentence has been passed, and as we look through history, look backwards at history, we can see that in many cases the Lord has already brought these things to fruition. Where are the gods of Babylon now? In fact, the city of Babylon is exactly what God said through the prophets that it was going to be. There's nothing over there. Uh, I have a, a friend in our church who was serving in the Iraq war and uh, flew on helicopters over there and flew over the ruins of Babylon and had the, uh, the privilege of being able to see it. And it's nothing but a heap of ruins and desolation. There's nobody living there. Nothing except wild creatures, just like the Bible said was going to happen. There's nobody worshiping in those temples anymore. There's not a single soul, though, except one that was possessed with the faith of God's elect that could have believed that at the time that they were captives in Babylon. I mean, this is where we really need to try to get out of our present circumstances and carry ourselves and our imaginations into the position of a Jew living in Babylon. Your city has been destroyed, your home burned down, probably many of your family members killed, your temple is, uh, has been burned to the ground, and you're there in Babylon, and you see these ornate temples and the, the gold and the silver and the precious jewels in their, in their worship and everything, and you're supposed to tell them, these gods are going to go extinct. Now, you have to have great faith to be able to believe that when present circumstances sure don't look like it. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. They were to understand that uh, the knowledge of this god that they were worshiping, just this tiny little captive nation of the Hebrews, that he would have his name known and worshipped and celebrated around the globe. You see, we, again, we're living here in the 21st century, and, and we understand that Christianity is known on every continent uh, of the world. There's few, uh, still a few places in the world that the gospel of Christ has not uh, reached to, and the Lord's people are still working on that, and we'll get to them all in due time, I believe. But uh, at the time that this was going on, the only worshipers of God are in this little Mediterranean nation, and now they've been destroyed and conquered and spread out all over the, uh, that area of the Middle East. Now, who could have thought at that time that there would ever be a day when nobody would be worshiping the gods of Babylon and there would be millions of people around the world, maybe even billions, who are at least professing the name of the God of this nation of Israel? Who could have believed that in that time? As we continue to progress through history, we can add to that and say that one of the great honors of the gospel of Jesus Christ has been that it has thrown down the idols of the heathen. Amen. There's been a whole lot of things in church history that we uh, regret. We're not real happy that the way things were done in many ways, and uh, sometimes the, uh, the Christians made the error of incorporating some pagan practices into their uh, practice of Christianity, and yet still, the gods of the heathen were eradicated wherever the gospel went. Those who practice those ancient religions are usually only people in the very remotest parts of the world who have not been reached 
by Christian missionaries. Now, probably if you go on a university campus, you will find some people who call themselves pagans, but uh, if you push them very far, you'll find that they're just doing that as something of a fad. They're not really worshiping any of the uh, heathen gods like uh, the people in Jeremiah's day were doing. But it is true that their outlook is basically pagan. But again, it would have been utterly unthinkable in the days of Jeremiah or even the Apostle Paul that a day would come when really nobody is giving any credence to Zeus, Jupiter, or Athena, or just go down the list of the names of the false gods, these ancient gods that have been worshipped as long as anybody could remember. And yet, wherever the faith of Christ has been preached, idolatry has been brought down. And even where it remains, many of its more abominable customs have been destroyed. You think about uh, the hideous practice of widow burning in India that had gone on for century after century after century. And for a long time, the British government was trying to keep the Christians from interfering with the, uh, with the Hindu practices of that nation because uh, they didn't want to be thrown out by the, uh, their little enclave there, uh, by the native population, because they were exploiting them economically. But eventually, the pressure, the pressure from the real, sincere, earnest Christians became uh, so intense that they had to forbid the practice of widow burning. It's a, a horrible thing that had been done there for centuries. That was the gospel that did that. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, as many forms of idolatry has been brought down, it doesn't mean that man hasn't found many other ways to manifest his wickedness and to uh, produce different kinds of idols. But still, you don't even have to be a post-millennial to realize that this word that Jeremiah taught his fellow Jews to say to the captive Jews in Babylon had come, has come to pass. The gods of Babylon are extinct. Nobody's worshiping them anymore. Nobody's worshiping Zeus or Apollo or the, the gods that used to be worshipped by thousands or millions. And we rejoice to think that this is going to continue to be fulfilled. God isn't done destroying the idols of the heathen. Amen. As his anointed king smashes his enemies with a rod of iron, the day is ultimately going to come when this is brought to full and complete fulfillment. When Christ returns in the glory of his father with the holy angels, I suppose there will still be idolatry in the world to that time, but when that time comes, all of the rest of the gods of the heathen that are remaining will all be done away with once and for all. <clears throat> now just a moment with verse 12. I would point this out just by way of contrast with the perishing gods. In verse 12, Jeremiah returns to writing in Hebrew. Remember, verse 11 is to be spoken to the Babylonians in their own language. You're to communicate to the heathen clearly, your gods are not gods, and your gods are marked out for destruction. But then he goes back to Hebrew and resumes contrasting Israel's God with the vain, soon-to-be-destroyed idols of the heathen. The Babylonians were to be told that the gods they worshipped, along with every other idol, would perish from under the earth and from under the heavens. And we are to understand that there is only one God whose memorial abides to every generation. As the psalmist put it, the Lord shall reign forever, even thy God, O Zion, unto all generations. Amen. The one and only God who will survive the cataclysms of the ages is the one who is above all, the one who is from everlasting to everlasting, because he created the ages and he rules over them. He is the God who made the earth by his great power and stretched out arm. By a spoken word, he brought both the vast star-spangled heavens into existence and designed this amazing earth in which we live as a work of his artful wisdom. Every day, science is discovering more and more of the secrets of God's hidden wisdom in the creation, even though oftentimes the ones who are discovering those things are denying the very one who brought these incredible life forms into being, to say nothing of the mountains and the lakes, the valleys, the rivers, the oceans and the deserts, etc., it's, uh, I enjoy watching de nature documentaries, but it is frustrating when you watch the, uh, uh, the ones that are put out that become really popular, the BBC and whatnot, because they're always talking about design and things like that, but they never want to give glory to the one who made these incredible things that they're, uh, that they're photographing and showing to you. Yeah. But for us as believers, the more we can watch things like that, and the more we learn, the more we stand in awe of the majesty and the wisdom of our Creator. Nothing proves more conclusively the blindness of man than the fact that he thinks that because now he can scientifically explain phenomenons that used to be described in superstitious terms because nobody really knew why things were the way they were, 
He thinks that now that he can explain it scientifically that there must not be a need for a divine creator. Now how foolish is that? As if man, because he understands how something is working, does that mean that man is able to make it itself? We know that he can't replicate the, the work of God. He can't put life into anything. The fact is that all men are able to do is just to obtain a little glimpse into the glory of God's wisdom. But uh, as it says in the book of Job, how little a part of him is understood. There are countless more mysteries yet remaining to be unlocked, both here on earth and in the heavens, which the Lord stretched out by his own discretion, as verse 12 says. And uh, I think we can pretty safely say, since it's always been this way, that there is a lot of things that science thinks it knows today that 5, 10, 15 years down the road, they'll say, we were wrong about that. Man's learning will never catch up with the wisdom of the creator that gave him the life and the intellect to search into these things. <clears throat> well, so much for the exposition, and I realize I've been making applications right along, but uh, let's focus in now in our closing moments on making some applications from this glorious text that we've been looking at. Because this is a positively tremendous text, and I think that the lessons that it holds for us as the Lord's people are absolutely invaluable. First of all, as John Calvin strongly emphasized in his remarks on this text, we are taught here the absolute necessity of confessing our loyalty to God even under adverse circumstances. It had to be a very lonely thing to be a believing Jew in captivity in Babylon, surrounded by this pagan culture, among people who have conquered your nation, deported you from your homeland, burning down your own houses and all of your sacred sites. And we can be quite sure that the devil was tempting such believers to succumb to despair and abandon their devotion to Jehovah altogether. But even in addition to that, to confess God in the bold and unflinching way that Jeremiah is directing here, communicating to the people in their own language that your gods are not gods and they're going to perish, that certainly could have been very perilous for them as well. To tell the devotees of Bel or Nergal or Tiamat or any of these Babylonian idols that these gods upon whom you are expending such lavish devotions are going to perish from under the earth and the heavens and that the day is going to come when nobody will give a thought to your mighty gods and goddesses, well, I think we can readily understand that the Babylonians probably would not have reacted to that in a very friendly way. And they might have just laughed it off and said, well, these people are just stubborn and ridiculous. Why talk to them? But we also know, and we have an instance of it in Daniel chapter 3, with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that it could get you thrown into a fiery furnace, put to death some other way. And actually what you find uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego doing is obeying exactly what Jeremiah commands here and telling Nebuchadnezzar, this God that you have set up is no God. And we will not bow down and worship before your God. To be a true worshiper of God, we must set none before him and we must confess him. It was true then and it is true today. <clears throat> we need to remember that in scripture that we not only must believe with our heart, but we also must confess with our mouth. Our religion is not something that is to be kept secret, but we are to openly avow our God, even if it costs us our lives. We understand that in conditions of severe persecution and danger, we are not required to go flaunt ourselves in the streets and just offer ourselves up for martyrdom, as uh, there were Christians that did that in the early days of the church. But uh, Christ does give us permission that if they persecute you in one city, flee unto another. But still, when challenged, we must confess the name of our Lord and never deny him. Amen. With the heart, man believeth unto righteousness, but he doesn't stop there. He also adds, with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. There must be a verbal uh, expression of the faith that is alive in the heart. And a part of our confession must always be that our God is the only true God and that all other gods will perish. Uh, I think it's in Acts 14. It may have been in Lystra, if my memory, if my memory is serving me well, where uh, the people were so impressed by uh, Paul and Barnabas healing the man that they wanted to do sacrifice to them. And Paul and Barnabas basically tell them the same thing that Jeremiah is saying here. We're preaching to you to turn from these vanities unto the living God that made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything that is in them. He's been giving you rain from heaven and fruitful seasons and filling your hearts with food and gladness. Quit worshiping your idols and don't worship us. Bow down before this one true living God. 
Our religion is a completely exclusive religion. Amen. We have to believe that and we have to confess it, even when there are a lot of people calling themselves Christians who are denying it. Our God is the only creator. Our Savior is the only Savior. His way of salvation is the only way of salvation. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through him, by means of him. Amen. That is the confession that the Lord's people must make. It's a confession that we have always made, that there is only one God, and that you can only come to God on his terms. <clears throat> and then finally, may we all take to heart the lesson that all of the gods of the nations, including the gods of the 21st century, they're all idols, and they must all perish. And that is a matter of great rejoicing for the Christian. We live in a world where we fight against spiritual wickedness in high places, against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. And idolatry manifests itself in countless shapes. Perhaps today it's not as grotesque and overt as the great statues and monuments that were built in distant times by the Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Greeks, the Romans, and others, but the reality is that idolatry is just as prevalent in our time as it ever was because idolatry isn't just manifested by doing something external, it is a sin that springs out of the heart. Amen. I know that this congregation here has often heard uh, Calvin's quote that the heart is a manufacturer of idols, and that is absolutely true. Idolatry does not begin with the carving of the image or statue, but it begins in the heart of man that has turned away from God. And man doesn't even need to have a visible image to have an idol, because in truth, to have a higher loyalty and devotion to anyone or anything besides the one true God is to be an idolater. Amen. And that means that we can commit the sin of idolatry even over something that in many ways is a good thing and a blessed thing. It's a wonderful thing to be married, for a husband to have a wife. But uh, if a man is married to a woman who says, if you keep on following after Christ, I'm not going to stay with you to say, okay, I'll give up my Christianity because I want to keep my marriage and my children, that would be an act of idolatry. Even though marriage in itself is a good and a blessed thing, we are to cherish our God and our Christ above even the marriage relationship. <clears throat> Every idol that sets itself up in competition with Jehovah will perish for the simple reason that man's idols have no power at all against the one who made the heavens and the earth. When the smoke clears... All of the pretenders and the usurpers will be gone, utterly destroyed, and the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. There will be no more pride, no more idolatry, nothing that glorifies man, only that which glorifies God. Amen. And that is the day which the Christian hopefully and joyfully expects, because it grieves our hearts that men would render worship to anything besides the one true and living God, Amen. that men would trust for salvation and security in any Savior other than Jesus Christ. And if you are not a believer this evening in the Lord Jesus Christ, we have to say that Jeremiah's message is not a good one for you. It's not a positive one, but one that uh, you need to take to heart and consider very carefully. For mark it down, except you are worshiping God through Jesus Christ, you are an idolater. You don't have to be going into a heathen temple to be an idolater. Just put anything ahead of God in your life, and that makes you an idolater. So whether it's money power, sex, some other person or institution, what we see from this text is that your idol is marked out for destruction. If you're just worshiping your, your own pleasure, your own pride, well, your idol is going to die when you die. And that's, that's not a very good idol to have. That's only going to be here for a few short years. Looking around at the world as we see it now, it looks impossible to think that uh, things are going to improve or get better or that uh, the word of God is going to be victorious in the end. It seems like uh, the devil has been having his way for two, three hundred years now. But the things that look impossible to us, in reality, it doesn't look nearly as dark as it did in Jeremiah's time. Again, there are a whole lot more people professing the name of the true God now than there were when Jeremiah was living when there's only this one little nation and the vast majority of them aren't even true worshipers of God. But we do look at the world around us, and it's very easy to be troubled as we see that all of the power and influence, whether it's in government or in the institutions of culture, 
It seems like it all belongs to the avowed enemies of God who champion and celebrate every form of evil. And as we uh, investigate and find out what sorts of plans they have for the future, it makes your hair stand on end to think of the things that they would like to accomplish. But it's really good news to know that however far the Lord lets them go, that the time is coming when that's all going to be curbed and brought to ruin. The fact is that the gods of our generation are just as sure to be destroyed as the ancient gods of Babylon. Amen. Those gods are long gone and forgotten. You read about them in the history books if you study ancient history, and uh, very few people could even name you one of the names of the gods of Babylon. But the gods that men are worshiping now, and we could go just naming them off, the gods of Darwinism, the gods of pleasure, power, superstition, whatever men are worshiping now, they're all going to perish from this earth and from under these heavens. So don't worship yourself or some other man because either you or the person that you are giving your devotion to are soon going to die and be forgotten and hardly anybody will even know that you were ever here. Man makes a very poor God. Give your loyalty and devotion to none except the sovereign Jehovah and approach him as a humble worshiper through the grace of his son because God does receive sinners through Jesus Christ and because of Jesus Christ and what he accomplished for sinners on the cross of Calvary. And when you come to God that way, having truly humbled yourself in genuine repentance, then and only then will you serve a God who can, serve, who can secure all of your best interests for time and for eternity. Let's close with a brief word of prayer. <clears throat> Our blessed God and Father, I thank you that we can worship you, the one true and the living God that from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Please bless your people here in this congregation, Lord. Please bless your people wherever they are to be able to understand these truths and not to be uh, turned into cowards by the opposition that uh, we might encounter, but that we would be bold and zealous advocates for the one true and the living God. Please bless your people, Lord, and may uh, the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace in believing that we may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.